way, whether you want to hear me or not, you get to. And uh, we're glad to be back here at Fargo Baptist Church. Always a blessing to be here. I uh, do want to mention that um, Mrs. Conroy has uh, put my books uh, kind of on display out there in the lobby. And so if you do not have uh, any one of the books that I've written, there are five of them out there, uh, titles that are uh, familiar to many of you. And so if you are not familiar with those, go out there and uh, Mrs. Conroy will direct you to those. But if you're interested in those, they are featured this week, and I encourage you to get them. I believe they'll be helpful to you and perhaps to someone that you know. Luke chapter 16. Luke 16. I made a pitch on Sunday night for a raspberry pie, and I got one. So tonight... No, I'm just kidding. But I do appreciate... Dominic and Savannah showing up in my classroom Monday promptly right before class and handing me a fresh raspberry pie. It is in the room with a large gaping hole in one side. And there is a little voice underneath that cellophane that says, come get me. And I'll be there after class tonight. (laughs) Thank you, Savannah, and God bless you. My gratitude to everyone that has been so kind. My wife came up here with me this year. She's always excited to come and promptly got ill, and uh, she has been in bed for the last four days. Uh, She is feeling a little bit better today and actually sat up for a little while, and so... Thank you for your prayers and your kindnesses. People have brought soup and footies, and, and we, got a, we got a nice little gift box with no name on it. I don't know who to thank, but whoever you are, thank you very much for that. Luke 16. This message tonight will not be as much of an exegetical message as it will be a text, textual message. I trust it will be an encouragement as we consider the theme at Fargo Baptist Church this year of loving God and loving one another. And it's sort of like the message on Sunday night. There's a bit of groundwork before we come to uh, draw the net, and you'll get to see how this ties within the theme, I believe, as we come toward the end of the message. Luke 16, the first verse. And he said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. The same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then said he to another, and how much owest thou? And he said, an hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, take thy bill and write four score. And the Lord, now this would be the man who confronted him in the early verses of the chapter. The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. Wisely here in the sense of the world's wisdom. And then he says this, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Again, a reference to worldly wisdom. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If, therefore, ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The obvious implication being you can't serve God and mammon at the same time. 
Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to ask for the fullness of the Spirit of God and the help of God as I give these thoughts tonight, and I'm asking that thou wilt do a work in the hearts of thy people, and that reviving and victorious living and joyous experience will be the testimony at Fargo Baptist Church. May God be glorified. We ask this in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm not sure exactly what this unjust steward was doing, but it appears that he was either overcharging the creditors or embezzling or both. He was found out and confronted and reprimanded and dismissed. And as he thought through his predicament, he said something that is very common, may I say this, in American Christianity. Notice what he said. To beg, I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do. And he went out with a very cleverly hatched plan to make sure that when he left his current position, he would have a soft place to land. Now, what he did was sit down with the creditors. And if he had been overcharging... He knew how much he had overcharged each one. And so when the fellow said, I owe a hundred measures of, uh, uh, of oil, he said, well, you just take your bill and write 50 because apparently it overcharged him 50 measures. If he'd been embezzling, he had the money to pay it back to the Lord. So this man didn't have to pay it. Either way, and the same with the wheat, a hundred measures of wheat down to four score. He was doing a favor to the creditors so that they would look at him when they found out he needed help and say, well, hey, you help me, I'll help you. And the Lord commended him for his worldly wisdom. He depended on himself. He figured out a way to get himself out of trouble. Notice what what the Lord said. After he commended him for doing wisely in the sense of the wisdom of the world, even though what he had done was crooked, notice what he says in verse 9. Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Does that sound like godly counsel? Go have a bunch of worldly friends. (laughs) So that when you fail, he didn't say if you fail, he said when you fail. And any time we depend upon ourselves, any time we find ourselves in a fix, in a predicament, ourselves, we're going to find out, is this, is this not, a, I must have bumped it. I think I'm out of battery in this pack. It's not, not on at all, is it? No. All right. Okay. We'll just stay right here. I'm tied. Doesn't work very well for me, but I'll work on it. When you fail, any time we try to work things out on our own, it is an automatic guarantee that failure is coming. It's an interesting thing to me that faithfulness to our great God is then the closing theme where he says, he that is faithful in that which is least would also be faithful in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If, therefore, you've been unfaithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? The idea is that God is looking down upon our lives. And if we're always going to try to work things out our own way, in our own energy, with our own wisdom, with our own smarts, with our own resources... God's not going to really entrust us with anything valuable because he knows how we're going to handle it. It's interesting to me that without technology, the first century Christians turned the world upside down. With technology, the world is turning us upside down today. 
We, more than any other generation, I think it's safe to say in United States history, have invited the world into the church in an effort, and I say we, I'm speaking at large. I'm not just limiting that right here. I'm saying we as believers in the 21st century in the United States, we're inviting the world into the church in order to maintain impressive numbers or in an effort to, to somehow have the biggest and the largest and the widest and the, the you know, and, and nothing wrong with size. I'm glad for any number of people getting saved. I'm glad for any size of a ministry. But I'm saying that we need to remember that if we're resting in ourselves, it's doomed to failure. I'm drawn to certain stories in the Bible. I think of the story of Hannah. She wasn't ashamed to beg. She wasn't. This man was ashamed to beg, and I I think that perhaps without even realizing it, without even thinking about it, without even knowing it as a generation, we're ashamed to beg, and we're resolved what to do. We'll figure it out somehow. Hannah didn't resolve what to do because she could read her history books and she found out what happened when Sarah, the wife of Abraham, resolved what to do. The result of that was Ishmael and that was not a good thing. She could follow history a little farther and she could pick up on the story of of Jacob and Rachel. And she could see what, Ra- what happened when Rachel took matters into her own hands and, and when she was resolved what to do. And she gave her handmaid to Jacob. And the result was Dan and Naphtali, two of the twelve sons of Jacob. But it wasn't a good thing. She wasn't ashamed to beg. And if you were to go back with me for just a moment to 1 Samuel chapter 1. First Samuel chapter 1. Because of time constraints and because I think most of us here would be somewhat familiar with the story, I won't read the whole passage, but look at verse 10. And she, that is Hannah, was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. I don't think that means, dear friends at Fargo Baptist, that she wiped one or two tears away. I'm not sure that we would, if we had known Hannah in person, I'm not sure that we would have recognized her voice for its distortion and for its strain. We might have wondered, who is that praying over there? I don't recognize that voice. She was in bitterness of soul. She was weeping. You know what happens when when a little child falls and and comes running into mama and mama says, what happened? You don't know what happened because the weeping clouds the voice. She reached a point where words would not come and the Bible says that only her lips moved. If you read a few verses later, she was in such an agony. She was not ashamed to beg. And she didn't get an Ishmael out of her begging. She got a Samuel out of her begging. Because she wasn't resolved what to do to figure it out on her own. She begged God. She begged for God to do something. She begged for God to intervene and to do something for her. And we all know the story of Samuel and how he was brought to the the tabernacle as a very little boy. And and she took a new coat up to him every year. And and, and this little boy, Samuel, stood head and shoulders over Eli, the high priest, and, and led the nation of Israel for decades in one of the greatest periods of revival in the history of Israel. 
because she begged. She begged. She wasn't ashamed to beg. I think of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a king at the time that Sennacherib came and besieged the city of Jerusalem. History was full of examples of what Hezekiah could have done. You know what? He could have resolved to hire the Syrians. Asa did that in 2 Chronicles 16 too. He could have resolved to intrude into the temple and perhaps uh, gain some favor with God. Uzziah did that in 2 Chronicles 26. He could have turned to the idols like his father Ahaz when his father Ahaz went out and conquered another country. What did Ahaz do? He brought the idols back home and worshipped them. (laughs) He could have done that. He could have resolved what to do. But you know, he also had some examples in history of people who begged. Like Asa, who begged against a million strong army from the Ethiopians and God gave an amazing victory in a one day battle. He could have, he, he, he learned to beg like Jehoshaphat who prayed against the Moabites and the Ammonites in Second Chronicles chapter 20 and God gave such an amazing victory that it took them three days to collect the spoil and they didn't even have to fire the first stone out of a sling. They didn't even fight. They stood out on the hill and sang. And God won the battle for them. And Jehoshaphat, or or excuse me, Hezekiah, as he sees the armies of Sennacherib surrounding the city, he has the options. Well, what should I do? Should I I hire the Syrians? Should I I, uh, maybe run into the temple and offer an offering? What should I do? What should I... And I'll tell you what he did. He begged. He wasn't ashamed to beg. And he got on his face. And if you were to read with me tonight in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, 2 Chronicles 32, just a, just a couple verses if you would go there with me. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. And verse 20. And for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos prayed and cried to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. He prayed and cried. He wasn't ashamed to beg. And if you read the story in Kings and, and follow it also in, the, in Isaiah 36, 37, 38, in that portion, you'll find out that, that this siege lasted a long time and, and Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sent uh, his, uh, uh, his henchman, Rabshakeh, and Rabshakeh came up and he threatened the people who were standing on the city wall and he mocked them and he mocked the god of Hezekiah and he told them Hezekiah was a fool and they shouldn't listen to him. And when the king of Assyria had to call his men and go fight another battle, they sent a letter to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah took the letter. And the Bible says he went up and he spread the letter out in front of the Lord. And he said, Lord, everything that Sennacherib says in this letter is true. He has conquered every other nation. He has conquered them all. And and, and now he's threatening us. And he says, Lord... And he holds, it's like he's holding up the letter. He said, Lord, would you read this letter? Lord, look how he's blaspheming you. Oh, God, would you step in here? He wasn't ashamed to beg. He didn't make up his mind what to do. He begged. He begged. I think of Daniel, chapter 1. He goes from his native Israel as a captive. He's under the prince of the eunuchs. He's 17 years old or 18 maybe. According to Bible chronology studies that I've read, he was 17 or 18. 
And because he was under the leadership of the master of the eunuchs, you don't have to be a scientist to figure out what the Babylonians did to him. What a terrible thing to happen to a young man right in the prime of his life. But Daniel just made up his mind. He wasn't going to defile himself with the king's meat. He wasn't going to get bitter. And in chapter 2, he finds out that his life is in danger because all the wise men of Babylon are going to die. And the reason they're all going to die is that the, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers couldn't tell uh, Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was and what it meant. What did Daniel do about that? Did he get a bunch of advisors together and say, now look, we've got to figure this thing out. Uh, we're going to die tomorrow if we don't figure out what to do. We've we got to do something. No, he started begging. He started begging. And he got alone with God and he sent a message to Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. And he said, pray and fast and cry to God. You know the story. He got his answer. He went into Nebuchadnezzar, told him the dream, told him what it meant, and was promoted in the kingdom. And Daniel's career was off to an amazing beginning because he didn't resolve what to do. He begged. He didn't use the smart. Listen, Daniel would have scored 800 on his SATs. He was brilliant. The Bible says 10 times more that he knew than any of the Babylonians. You read chapter 1. The guy was a genius. He could have figured anything out. But he wasn't above begging. And because he wasn't above begging, God intervened for him. Esther, one of my favorite Old Testament characters, along with Hannah. Amazing story. We're not going to go there. But, but you know the story of how she got on her face and she sent a message to Mordecai and fast for me and pray for me. I've got to go into a Hazariris and I've got to present my petition. And if he doesn't hold out the golden scepter, I'm a dead woman. It was a very real threat. It was a very real problem. But she got the message from Mordecai. And the message was, if you don't go in and present the request, if you don't go and beg for your people, God will raise up deliverance from some other place. But who knows but what you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther, this may be the one and only reason you were ever elevated to be the queen. You miss this opportunity, you won't have, you'll have missed it all. And she went in to beg for her people. She wasn't ashamed to beg. I think of the church in Acts chapter 12. James, the brother of John, has been beheaded. And because Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, he was planning to do Peter in also. And the church got together and they made intercession without ceasing unto God for him. They were crying out and begging God for Peter's life. They didn't arrange a, a group of protesters to march through the streets of the city, down with the Caesar, down with the Caesar, up with freedom, up with freedom. No, you know what they did? They went to the house of Mary and they got on their faces before God and begged God. They begged him for the life of Peter. And little did they know that while they were begging, Peter was walking down the streets thinking he was in the middle of a dream. Kind of like some of us when we get up in the middle of the night. And then we stub our toes and we realize this is not a dream. This is the cold hard facts of children who leave drawers open and rolling toys out in the hallways and other disorganized people. Oh, listen, one of the ways that God manifests his love to you and me is to teach us 
to pray our Father. Our Father. One of the ways he wants us to understand his great love for us is to to introduce in in Matthew's gospel and in other places the concept that we, we pray to a Father, a benevolent, loving Father. And if ye, he says to us as earthly fathers, he says, if ye then being evil, and he means there that we have a sin problem, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give good things to them that ask him? His love for us is manifested by his answering those prayers. He, I I believe God longs to answer prayer. I believe he loves to answer prayer. I believe that answering prayer is is one of the greatest joys and and privileges that God senses, if, if God indeed senses privilege. I think God absolutely, just practically, has a fit of delight when he sees one of his children begging. And you know, that's not just limited to the way God shows his love for us. But you know what happens when God shows his love to us and answers one of our prayers? What happens to you when you get a really important prayer answered? Do you love God just a little bit more when that happens? Does it motivate inside you just a a spirit of gratitude? Does Does it make you want to just perhaps... It, click your heels in the spirit, so to speak? Does it make you want to just thank God out loud? Does it make you want to thank him in the prayer closet? Does it make you wish you could just run up to the gates of heaven and run inside and find the Father and wrap your arms around him and say, Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. You'll never know what it means to me that, that you did this for me, that you did that for me, that you answered this. Oh, God, thank you. Doesn't it make you love him more? This year, it's about loving God. I cannot think of a way that is more conducive to generating our love for him than for us to have important, significant prayers answered. The prayer stories that I've given you tonight, Hannah's request was not a little thing. She wasn't praying that when she got to the dentist, it would be a filling and not a root canal. Now, if you've ever had a root canal, you might be sitting there thinking, wow, that's a huge thing, Pastor Farnham. And don't you laugh at me about my root canal. Well, I'm not because I had one too. And it didn't work, and the tooth came out anyway. No, she wasn't praying about something minuscule. She wasn't praying about something that was unimportant. She was on her her last ounce of grace, as it were, begging for God to give her a son. And all she wanted to do with this, she didn't want the son for herself. She didn't want this selfishly. She didn't want to throw it in Penina's face like Penina had been throwing her children in Hannah's face. She wanted to give her child to God. She wanted her child to serve the Lord. That's all she wanted. And she begged and begged and begged. It was significant. It was important. It was top of the prayer list kind of request. For Hezekiah, the protection of the city of Jerusalem, the holiest of holy cities of all the people of God. Listen, this was not some small thing. And as the king who was charged with the protection of the people of God, this was numero uno for him. It was important. For Daniel... For Esther, for the church, wherever. Find, find your prayer stories. Find them in Genesis. Find them all the way to Revelation. Pick any book of the Bible. Dig around. You'll find somebody desperate, crying out, begging, pleading for God to intervene. And you will find God stepping in in ways that would absolutely mesmerize us. 
were we to be in the audience watching God at that moment of history. Nehemiah built a wall in 52 days. Get that one in your thoughts. 52 days. They didn't have cranes. They didn't have locomotives. They didn't have bulldozers. They had people. And if you read uh, Nehemiah chapter 3, it was people from all walks of life. I mean, the jewelers and the, and the business people. Everybody got together. Uh, you know, you think of a guy who spends his life cutting little tiny diamonds. He's out there moving rocks, you know, half the size of this platform to build a wall for the city. And if you read what Nehemiah has to say about it, he gave the credit to God because it was to God's glory because he had prayed. And it wasn't a simple little, well, Lord, it'd be nice if you do this. It was begging to the point that the king back in Shushan, the palace, could see something wrong on Nehemiah's countenance. And he says, Nehemiah, what's wrong? What's wrong? It affected him. It burdened him. Answered prayer will motivate you to deeper and stronger and sweeter love for God. So that you can go out of 2018 when the month of December rolls around and you can give up a panorama back over this year and say, in 2018, I learned to love God more. And part of the reason was God intervened for me. And the reason he intervened is that instead of resolving what to do with my own wisdom, I just begged God for what I needed. I begged him. I begged. I pleaded with God. I cried to the God of heaven. This kind of answer will never occur if our prayers are not pointed begging. And when I mean that specific, they are, they're focused on something. There is a specific need and we point it out to God. And you say, what's the, what's the necessity of that? He knows what we have need of before we ever ask him. That isn't the point. Part of our begging is to express our dependence upon him. And when we express that dependence, he's listening. If we can figure it out on our own, there's nothing for him to listen to. Beg him. Pointed begging. Get down to what you really are needing. What about the the souls of lost people? What about the Christian growth of someone who seems to be uh, swerving into carnality or into worldliness? What about those things that are that are truly important? Not only do we need pointed begging, we need passionate begging. I know there are some people that will cry at the drop of a hat and they'll even drop the hat. I know other people don't cry much. But I do know that God sees our tears. And I know that there's something about that that registers with him. But whether it is literal tears on your cheeks or whether it is the agonizing cry of a broken heart, Because God sees the heart. He doesn't always have to see the tears. But I've learned that sooner or later everybody cries. And I wonder if perhaps if we just got down and just poured out our souls. And begged. If we might see some amazing interventions. And when we see those amazing interventions, because we have prayed passionately, we just love him better than we did before. We need pointed begging. We need passionate begging. We need persistent begging. Because I'm not going to promise you that you'll pray one time 
and you'll have the answer before you get back to the pew. That wasn't the first prayer Hannah ever prayed. But it was the last for a son. Because God gave her a son, she didn't have to ask for that anymore. This was not the first time Hezekiah had prayed for the protection of the city of Jerusalem. The the siege of Sennacherib lasted for years. No, he had prayed many times. But this begging that we see, where he and Isaiah are praying together and crying to the God of heaven, it was the last prayer they had to pray because... In the morning, the city was surrounded by dead corpses. 185,000 of them. A great day for funeral directors. Persistent begging. You know, you can follow the life of Daniel. He didn't stop praying at the end of chapter 2. We find him... In chapter 6, and by the way, the the book of Daniel is not all chronological. Chapter 6, Daniel is at the very end of his life, 89, 90, 91 years of age. And you know what the Bible says about it? He opened his windows and prayed three times a day as he did a four time. He was still begging God. He was still begging God. Esther, the church, any of the great Bible characters, persistent there are people in this room who have come to this altar and before you came to Fargo Baptist Church as a student or before you moved to Fargo you were maybe in some other church and you used to go to that altar and rededicate your life and ask God for victory in a certain thing and and you know you'd you'd pray about it a couple of days and kind of forget about it and and fall into the same pattern and so on you know what I think this church needs I you know what I think all the churches in the United States need We need to quit resolving what to do. We need to stop trying to figure out a three-step process or a seven-step process or whatever it is to find a way out of our troubles and get on our knees and beg. Beg. I believe that's what Fargo Baptist Church needs. And I'll tell you what, when that starts happening and when it's pointed and when you are focused on something specific and, and, it, and it, is so, it is so heavy on your heart that you are just, you're just in agony about it and, and you are really seeking God about it and it's, it's not just pointed but it's, it's passionate and it's persistent and maybe you pray for a week or a month or a year or five years but you keep begging and you keep begging and you keep begging and one day... God's going to come through in a way that will just make you love him like you can't imagine loving him today. I can't dig To beg, I'm ashamed. I'm not going to be one of those slobbering Christians. Somebody told me that one day. Way back early in my Christian life, I had been to the altar when I was in college at Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I don't remember who was preaching, but I was greatly stirred, and I had wept at the altar, and I came back, and somebody said to me, basically, I made up my mind I'm not going to be one of those slobbering Christians. You can make up your mind that way too. But I think... Your answers to prayer will be minimal. And I think your love for him will be minimal. Because that father-son relationship is nurtured 
by answers to prayer. I want to ask you tonight, are you ashamed to beg? Are you ashamed to beg? Would you be ashamed if your roommate walked in on you and you were begging? Would you be ashamed if your husband walked in on you or your wife and you were, for lack of any other expression, in another world, weeping, begging God for something? Would you be ashamed if your parents saw you begging? Would you? Or your children? If you would indulge me a moment, I'll give a brief testimony. My parents were not saved. I had been a wicked, rebellious son. And after I was saved and went off to Bible college because I sensed God wanted me to preach, one of the first things God started dealing with me about was the way I treated my parents. And I determined that in between my freshman and sophomore years, I would go back to the farm and help my dad on the farm. I hate farming. But I wanted to go back and do something to help my dad. He was an old man by then. My parents married late, and so by the time I was 18, my dad was well into his retirement years, 60 plus And one of the things that was of great concern to me that first year of college before I went home was, God, who do you want me to spend the rest of my life with? And I made up my mind I was going to go home that summer and plead with God about that. And that's what I did. And every morning, we would get up at 4.30 and go milk the cows, and we'd come in after the milking and the and the chores and turning the cows out to the pasture and so on and mom would have a big breakfast and after breakfast before dad got all the things of the day organized I'd go into the bedroom shut the door and pray and one of the things I prayed was Lord please I want to know who you want me to marry would you please lead me to her one day my mother walked down the hall and she heard me praying and she swung open the door. Now now understand, she's unsaved. And she stood there and just laughed out loud. I kept on praying. She did that a number of times throughout that summer. But I'll tell you what, the God who sees in secret rewards openly. That fall, I got back to the campus in the second day of my sophomore year. I was standing in line registering for classes. This was back when people actually wrote things on paper. There were no computers. The compu- all the computers we had were like the size of that piano. You, you didn't carry them around in your pocket. I know that's hard to imagine, but yes, that was that day. It was like the previous century, you understand. I was standing in the registration line waiting to register for a class and I turned around. And there came Kathy Pope walking up behind me. One of the few popes that are Baptist. (laughs) I didn't hear an audible voice. I'll tell you what I did have. I had an assurance from the Spirit of God, three words. There she is. She'd be sitting on the second row tonight if she weren't sick. Folks, I want to tell you, God hears and answers prayer. And every blessing that I've ever had in the ministry is somehow connected to her because she's in it with me. 
I want to ask our instrumentalists to come tonight. And if you'll find number 357, we'll sing it in a few moments, but I'd like us to stand with our heads bowed, and you don't have to wait for the music to begin. I'm asking tonight, will you volunteer to be a beggar? Would you find a place tonight, somewhere at this altar, and say, Father, my prayers have been shallow. My prayers have been weak. And I'm volunteering tonight to become a beggar. A poor beggar. And I will come to you with some pointed begging. Not just tonight, but all my days, I'm going to be a beggar. I will come to you with some pointed begging, some passionate begging, and if need be, Father, persistent. And I'm going to beg for a week or a year or a lifetime whatever it takes. I volunteer to be a beggar. Our instrumental